It's my pleasure to welcome both Callan, our guest speaker, and Mike, who's our interviewer. And I think that everybody's looking forward to the session greatly, Callan. Um, many of them watched you at the virtual African Bird Fair and enjoyed your talk on that very, very much. And I think tonight we've got lots of new stuff that we're going to learn and hear about from you. So um, I think I'm going to hand over now to Mike and Callum. Right, um, here we are. Carl, are you there? I... Um, yeah, can you, yeah. Is my sound all right? Your sound's perfect, um, and my sound? Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. I, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people, as Priscilla mentioned, uh, watched your presentation at the Virtual African Bird Fair, and you'll all be very pleased to know that we're not going to just replicate that. We're hoping to show um, everyone something a little different. And really, we've tried to structure this in a way that it's unstructured. So uh, we've got some slides, but it's not meant to be um, a formal presentation. The slides are really just to supplement the conversation that uh, Kel and I are going to have for the next um, short while or, or however long it goes. So I promise uh, we won't keep you forever. Um, but, you know, Kel's a, a very good mate of mine, a very good birding mate and, and a good mate in general. And we've known each other for a very long time and it's it's an absolute pleasure to be able to um, interview you Cal, over a over a zoom call i, I hope we, we have a good time thanks all right so um before we do anything else i want to do a Cal and cohen quick fire so i'm just going to ask you Cal, some some questions i don't want uh, long answers i just want um maybe a couple of words if necessary but uh, these are just some quick fire questions and i think it might give um, people some idea of, of the kind of person you are and well, mostly the kind of bird you are. That's, that's why we're here. I'm not going to ask you what your favorite um, TV series is or your favorite <laughs> food. All right, so binocular brand. Uh, Swarovski. All right, are you uh, a 10 by or an eight by? Um, I'm, a, I'm a 10 by, but I'm a 10 by 32. Okay. So I, I, I have used eights before, I've used 10 by 42s before, I've used Leicas before, but at the moment, my favorite binoculars that I use are 10 by 32s. I really like the sort of compactness of them. I find 10 by 42s really heavy when you're carrying them around all day. Cool. Um, and I think the balance of light is good. Um, Canon or Nikon? Well, or I neither. sort of Canon, but I've gone over to Olympus recently. I've been experimenting with Olympus. And, and that's the mirrorless um, uh, system? Yeah, I have, okay. yeah. Um, yep. I'm delighted to say we're not going to talk about anything technical related to photography tonight. All right, how tall are you? Um, 194 centimeters, I think. So that's six foot, six foot four. Okay, so whenever I'm in the field with Cull um, or in a, a Fitz soiree, um, I'm always feeling very short. All right, so... Um, <laughs> This is a very difficult question for you, and we're not looking for a very long story. We just want to know what is the best bird you've ever seen? Congo peafowl. Is that long enough? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's short, but um, I, I think maybe just to to very briefly contextualize us, contextualize it. Tell us um, how many um, white people have seen a Congo peafowl. Um, I think, yeah, very, very few researchers and outsiders have seen Congo peafowl. Um, I don't know exactly how many. It's mainly primatologists who walk thousands of kilometers through the Congo Basin, um, but very, very few. Um, at the time that I saw it, which was a few years ago now, I think I was the only um, that sort of outside ornithologist to have seen, have ever seen one. So super special. And, and for those of you that have um, birds of um, Africa south of, of the Sahara, and um, the Congo peafowl is on the cover of that book. Okay, so what is the rarest bird you've ever seen? And, and it may be uh, the Congo peafowl, but if you have a different answer. Um, the rarest bird is probably step wimbrel. Depends okay. a bit on your taxonomy as to whether you regard step wimbrel as a full species or not. Um, and we don't currently regard it as a full species, but it's a very distinctive taxon. And it was thought extinct 
and um, Gary Allport found some in Maputo a few years ago, which I went up and studied with him. And there's probably only a handful of individuals that still survive breeding on the Russian steppes and then migrating down to the Mozambique coast. So that, that'll be the rarest one. That's um, obviously at the moment recognized as a subspecies of Eurasian wimbrel. Yeah, yeah. All right, what's your favorite birding location? Ooh. And, and um, um, my next question is, what's your favorite birding country? So they may be the same answer, but um, if, there are, if there are different answers, give me both of those. Ooh, um, it's really difficult. They actually changes all the time. Um, I think let me go local and say the Makuleke concession in Northern Kruger. Okay, great. That's uh, Northern, Northern Kruger, Pufuri, um, yeah. uh, Punda Maria area. Uh, well, no, in, in the Pufuri area. Yeah, and that's a, yeah, I have lots of favorite destinations. That's definitely one of them. Great. Um, and your favorite birding country? Again, that changes depending on where I've been recently. Um, but if I had a sort of a perennially favorite country, it's probably Uganda. I mean, the sort of size of it and the diversity of birds there and the diversity of really special birds there. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, what's your lifeless total? And you can say you don't know if you want. Um, give, us a, give us a range. I don't know. I mean, so you mean my Southern African list or my life list? To, um, oh, my world list. Yeah, um, give us your world list. I don't know. I don't know. It's, um, I've mainly focused on birding in Africa. So I know exactly what I've seen in Africa, but I've also birded a little bit outside of Africa in the US. And well, what's your, African, what's your African total? I don't know, but it's over 2000. That's very, very large. Um, what, is your, what is your garden list total? And we're gonna come back to garden lists in a, in a sec, but uh, just give us your garden list total. And I, I guess it might actually be the same number as your lockdown list total. It's pretty really close to my lockdown list total, which is 136. That's phenomenal. And you live in Scarborough. We'll come to Scarborough in a sec, but... Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an amazing number for, for Scarborough, Scarborough Garden. All right, um, just a couple, raptor or warbler? What do you prefer? Do you prefer a raptor or do you prefer a warbler? That is a very tough choice because those are two of my favorites. Why, why um, do you think I chose it? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's almost impossible. Um, let's go with warbler. Okay. And we'll have a warbler story, I think, at some stage this evening. Um, albatross or wader? Ooh, that's another tough one. Let's go with albatross. Okay. Barbet or woodpecker? Barbet. Okay. All right. Just uh, that's a little bit of fun to get us kicked off this evening. Um, so, you know, Cal, um, you and I met through an email. Um, and uh, when I started uh, preparing some questions, I asked you to remind me of when we met, because I know you document these things uh, much better than I do. And uh, you sent me an email, which um, was an exchange between the two of us. And it was your offer to the Cape Bird Club to, to take um, bird club members looking for Eurasian, European honey buzzards um, in, in the Newlands plantation uh, back in 2002. So then it was uh, a really special bird and it still remains a special bird, but um, it was uh, the first insight I had into the kind of person you were as a, as a, a birder in the Cape. Um, and we had a, a brief exchange. I couldn't join the excursion, um, but certainly um, what, what uh, well, rang very um, poignant to me was the comment you made at the bottom of the email, which said, all are welcome to attend but non-Cape Bird Club members will be encouraged to join if they enjoy the experience. So you were a stalwart of the Cape Bird Club. Maybe talk to me or talk to us about your early days as a birder in the, on the peninsula um, and, and how you were influenced by some of the Cape Town birders and, and the Cape Bird Club. Um, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I've been a Cape Bird Club member since I was 10 years old and, um, there were lots of people at the bird club who influenced me really positively and helped me get more into birding and encouraged me. Um, initially, it was my parents who encouraged um, my birding interests. Then I got involved with the South African Museum Club. I'm not sure if any of you remember that. Um, and then into the Cape Bird Club, where 
where all sorts of people influenced me. Um, people like um, Jan Hofmer, who took me penguin ringing in Betty's Bay, um, and Julie Tuchrun, um, people like Mel Tripp and Otto Schmidt, um, and really, you know, pretty much everyone who was in the Cape Bird Club at the time was sort of extremely, um, you know, encouraging and, you know, really facilitated me joining outings and, um, you know, it's a, it a very welcoming um, group of people. And I've been involved with the Bird Club um, a lot after that as well. Um, I made some good friends through the Bird Club, um, people like, you um, Claire Spottiswood, people like Kirsten Lowe, who I thought would be really important to mention this evening because, you know, Kirsten had a very good history with the Bird Club and, um, you know, I know a lot of you still remember him. And, yeah, um, I guess, um, I don't know if you want to direct my question anymore, Mike, if you have any. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, I think it's uh, relevant to say that this is a picture of Kirsten um, and, and he obviously yeah. passed away. Quite some some time ago, and I actually remember Kirsten. Um, I, I had one um, brief engagement with Kirsten um, in the early days uh, at a Cape Bird Club outing at Strandfontein, and I remember him taking me through how to distinguish between Lesser Swamp Warbler and and uh, Little Rush Warbler um, using their their calls, and and it was my first uh, introduction to Kirsten. I think I actually met Kirsten before I met you, and he told me about. Um, Nisner warblers in in the green belts and that afternoon I went and looked for Nisner warblers and um, so I, I do remember that was my one engagement with with Kirsten it was a very positive one so I think he is very sorely missed by the club and then maybe just yeah. um, talk to us about the fits because that was obviously a, a very key part of your um, your your growth as a birder and maybe your contribution and, and how you were influenced by the fits as well the other way around. Yeah, um, I guess since becoming a very keen birder at a young age, I guess I always thought that I wanted to be an ornithologist. And given that Cape Town has sort of one of the world's ornithological institutes, you know, right in Cape Town, you know, at UCT, at, you know, the Fitzpatrick Institute, it was sort of an obvious place to, you know, to gravitate towards. And um, again, I always found it a really welcoming environment, people like, you um, Peter Ryan was a great mentor and I, I studied through the University of Cape Town. I did my BSc and I went on to do um, a PhD through the FITS and, you know, which I did in a lot of people know in busted taxonomy and systematics. And I've gone on to keep quite a close association with the FITS. Um, you know, I'm no longer a full-time researcher, but I still run research projects on the side and you know, I help in small ways with students and some of the publications and I'm involved in doing a biodiversity field trip for the conservation biology master's course every year. That's what this picture is about. So I do a bit of general biodiversity training as well. Um, not just on birds, um, but also on flora and pollinator interactions and all sorts of other things. But I still maintain a very strong link with the fits. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm obviously, um, quite involved with the FITS at, at some level as well and it's it's always nice to to get together at the the annual AGMs and and see the amount of work that goes in there and unfortunately we haven't had live a live one this year but uh, I look forward to sharing a drink and a snack at the at the next uh, convening and then I think um, what I wanted to talk about was um, your your authoring and and the books that you've um, produced and, and authored and and I think um, this was, I think, my, my first knowledge of you. So I moved to Cape Town when I, was, um, I came down to university in 1991. And uh, I think university is a period of time where birding takes a back seat and other things uh, take a, a, a more uh, um, sort of primary interest. And so I lost the birding for a while. But when I came back to it, um, you had just uh, released Essential Birding, which it's, it's amazing how, how skinny the book is and how much information is crammed inside it. And I remember using um, your directions in the tank with Karoo on my first trip through Karoo Put and, and following your cinnamon breasted warbler directions to, to the meter and uh, succeeding with just about every single bird that you listed there. And it was a great way for me to um, discover the Western Cape birds um, in, in the way that they are so special compared to, to the rest of the country, the endemics, the Karoo, the Fainboss. So maybe, um, and I don't think this is anything we've ever discussed. What, what made you put 
together these incredible books, um, obviously with co-authors, and they played a large role as well. But um, as far as I know, you drove the projects um, to a large degree. And um, what made it um, a passion of yours to put these in, in writing? Um, yeah, so um, I mean, um, I was just smiling a little bit because I thought of something Kirsten would have said. <laughs> um, a good friend of mine and, and Claire's and always gently mocking of the book that he called essentially boring. I was just imagining you <laughs> running up boulder strewn slopes looking for cinnamon breasted warbler, which was one of the things he would always say that the word boulder, the, the words boulder strewn were used far too often in that book. But no, it is very much a collaboration with myself and Claire. Um, and I guess at that stage, we were just very, very much involved in local birding and, you know, wanted to share like a lot of the spots with people and um, felt that a lot of people would, you know, ask us for information and it just felt like a really nice way to sort of put the whole package together. And we approached Pippa Parker at Strake, who was really enthusiastic about the idea. Um, yeah, and sort of trusted us to take it forward. And yeah, I mean, I mean doing the project with Claire was really um, a sort of fantastic, um, you know, just a really good and fun project. And it was really nice sort of, being able to sort of distill that sort of our real passion for birding into this book, um, really fun doing it. Was was most so, of the sorry was most of the um, the content of the book was it um, sites that you had personally visited or did you draw on other birders' uh, contributions to to a lot of the local knowledge? I think um, the I mean as birders like like most things. Um, we do like build on the knowledge of others. So I think it's almost impossible to be like a complete independent birder. So um, everything we know is because others discovered it first really and we sort of building on it. And even things that aren't written down sort of pass through the birding community. So it's certainly true that a lot of our early birding knowledge would have been things drawn on scraps of paper by other friends or things that we people would have told us uh, things that we you know read in old publications um, and so in very it's you know a lot of it is built on that but we did make a special effort to go everywhere in the book and we also put a lot of effort into finding new places and so what we did um, for essential birding, which then sort of morphed into a much bigger book, the Bird Finder, sort of more complicated project that involved others too, is that we would sort of go to a site that we knew would, would might have been told to us or that we knew was good or that was famous. And we would try to sort of see what specials were there and what the habitat was like. And then we would often try and find a slightly different site nearby that we could then explore too. So we did a lot of driving around and I mean, we all like pins these days, but you know, noting mileages. Um, a lot of things in Bushmanland, for example, Bushmanland and the Tankwa Karoo, um, you know, Porfido, Brunt Bay, a lot of those sites weren't specifically known. So we drove around and found spots for birds and noted how many kilometers it was between the places. And then, you know, spent a lot of time exploring there and adding places that, that people hadn't birded or shared before. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, uh, and, and then I guess uh, Bird Finder, South African, Southern African Bird Finder was, was the same kind of idea, but on super steroids and, and obviously a much bigger project. So I, I know um, and we had met and got to know each other as birders then, and, and I, I know it, uh, it was many years off your life um, uh, taken, uh, putting this uh, book together, but it really has been used, I think, extensively and has set the, the, the bar for other books that followed. Yeah, it was a much, much bigger project. Um, we took on a lot. We had some really great um, people who helped us with it. Um, if you look at the acknowledgements, you'll see there's like two full jam packed pages of acknowledgements because lots of people, um, you know, shared their, you know, special sites with us. Um, and we divided the whole region into all of these different routes um, and people shared lots of tips with us. And so, I mean, Jonathan came on as a co-author Etienne um, in the Kauteng area, Anthony Sizek in Zimbabwe, and Pete Leonard helped a lot in Zamba in areas that we didn't know as well. But we did travel through most of the areas in the book again, driving around, making notes of mileages between places. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was quite a lot of work, but a lot of fun. Um, Have you ever been um, uh, served any papers or sued for birds that people didn't find that you said they would find? <laughs> um, Thankfully not. I, I, I've sent you a couple. Have you not received them? 
I'm getting used okay. to ignoring them. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Kill. I mean, yeah, I mean, the the bird finders and, and essential birding were, were books that I, I got very early on and I've used them extensively. So they've been an absolute pleasure for me. And I think a lot of people have have uh, seen a lot of birds as a result of uh, the work that you put in there. So I very much well, appreciate it. We are planning an update. It's going to be a little bit different, um, but we'll let people know in due course um, what to expect. Okay, and then moving on, um, I'm going to to pull up a slide, and there's, uh, the, I'll, I'll come to the four individuals in the slide in a second. But um, I'm just going to make reference to Birding Big Days. Um, uh, I uh, arranged a Birding Big Day with Cull and and uh, my, our other good friend Dave Winter, who's who's obviously a, a very prominent birder in, in the Cape Town area as well. And our plan was to do a Birding Big Day in the um, sort of Swellendam area, so cover Bontebok National Park and and then cross the mountain and go into um, into the, the sort of Barrydale area. And um, I remember the plan was to stay out in Swellendam the night before, so we could get a nice uh, decent night's sleep and then wake up at 4.30 and, and start birding immediately. But Cull had a function on the Saturday night. So he said, well, we, we can only leave on the Sunday morning. So we left Cape Town at two o'clock in the morning drove for two and a half hours, nearly hit a, a, a porcupine as we entered Krutfader's Bosch. Um, but we had an incredible day. I was um, relegated to list keeping because my skills weren't quite up there. But uh, I remember we we cracked 200 species with a, a red bull fire finch at Furlicate Nature Reserve. So um, that was a very good day of birding and it was a, a good number to get in the Western Cape. But tell us about your most recent um, birding big day attempt that you, you did at the end of last year. So that's the segue into this photo. Talk us through the cool. individuals in the picture and tell us a little bit about that. Um, cool. Let me, yeah, I'll do that. I do, have, of course, have to mention that senior mentioned Dave Winter. Dave is my sort of original birding buddy. Um, we met when we were extremely young and both just, just getting into birding and figuring it all out. We met in Kirstenbosch and sort of showed each other different species of birds at the, that had for some reason escaped the other one and really developed a great friendship that still goes on to this day. So it's, it's really cool. So it was great doing that with you and Dave as well. So yeah, birding big days. Um, I try not to be too list focused, as you know, not being able to tell you what my life list is. But every now and again, I do find it rather fun to do a very intense bit of listing. I've done quite a few birding big days. Um, I've done um, birding big days on the Cape with um, Peter Ryan and John Graham and Claire. Um, I've done birding big days, the champions of the flyway in, in Israel with friends. And um, the, probably the most fun birding big day was one that I did recently. Um, uh, we did it um, in the Southern Kruger Park. Um, and we had just an incredibly intense day. Um, getting 335 um, species in 24 hours, um, which is such an amazing roller coaster ride. I think we, um, uh, yeah, and, and I'll, I've got a, I'll just tell you a bit about the participants, what we did, and I've got a little map, so I can show you very roughly kind of what yeah. we did um, without going into too much detail. But um, show, show the map quickly, maybe just to contextualize it first. Yeah, so it was in the Southern Kruger Park. So you can see, this is a Google map, you know, Google Earth type map. So you can see how the Kruger National Park is just uninhabited compared to the areas around. But the key to, to really getting a high total on birding big day is to mix lots of habitats together. And so it's nice, so you can see how the Kruger Park is essentially these big plains with open, with rivers flowing through them. Whereas if you look to the south, there's mountainous regions and those different sort of mountainous regions and agricultural lands near them give that sort of diversity of habitat that's really cool to get a high total. So if you go just maybe just back to um, back to the slide of the team. So maybe just one more back. So, I mean, the thing with Birding Big Days is they, they're like phenomenal team events. You like a lot of the success of like all the Birding Big Days that I've been involved with is like working really well with a team of people. And it's one thing going out and birding by yourself, which is really fun. And I've kind of enjoyed a lot too. But when you're birding with a team, it's also really fun because you have to kind of work with everybody's personalities and skills. And um, often it's even more fun just when everything goes well together. And so our birding big day team, um, the Raven Dickops, I think our name was, was um, 
was um, Mark Grenier on the right, Brad Arthur sort of in the middle, and then myself and Michael Mills. And um, Michael was definitely our sort of planning extraordinaire. Um, you know, he, you know, really took the planning down to like an absolute fine scale. Um, in terms of the sort of things we did, where we went, um, Michael and Mark did a lot of wrecking because they live in that area for months before. But then about a week before, Brad and I, and all four of us went to the area and just went through all the different sites um, and tried to sort of optimize them for how the day was going to work. And we literally broke the day down into sort of five minute gaps without stopping to eat even. Um, and just the sort of incredible intensity experience is quite fun. So if you go on to the next slide, uh, it's just a picture of um, sort of master planner, Michael, the scanning. This is a, um, a bridge leading into the Kruger National Park. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, just to give um, some sort of sense of context of what we did. So we started um, at midnight um, in, um, the, in the Nelspruit area, um, looking for night birds. In the initial, um, we'd arrange access to farms to look for night birds on dams um, and, uh, and all sorts of things. But the initial evening, it actually rained quite a lot. So at, at midnight, when it started, we had this absolute, you know, dead cert spot for freckled nightjar. Um, which wasn't there because there was this light rain. We never saw freckled nightjar again on the, on the, the entire time. So that was like the first bird that we were absolutely definitely going to and see. You, and you dipped. <laughs> we didn't see it, yeah. And then we went to these, and, and it was light rain. And a lot of the birds that we thought we were going to see, we just didn't see. Um, like there were no night, the night birds just really weren't calling. Um, and so it was overcast as well. So often night birds call a lot more with the moon. So it didn't start well. We got a bonus buff spot of Flufftail because it was very misty. And on one of the tropical rivers that we stopped on just to sort of have a little break and scan and listen, we had a buff spot of flufftail calling in some sort of riverine forest that was a real bonus. So we did pull, pull one back. And we then started on at dawn in Kruger, which is a great place to start because the Kruger Park's just absolutely bursting with diversity. But again, there was no sunrise because it was, it was raining very, very lightly. So there was no dawn chorus. So we did get quite a lot of birds in the dawn chorus in the sort of generalized morning, but um, like the previous two days, we'd been at that exact spot and got like a whole lot of extra birds that we just didn't see it, didn't see or hear at all. Um, but then things went really well and we managed to stick to our plan and a lot of the territories of birds that we'd um, staked out in advance, a lot of the birds were just there. Um, and so we had some really good luck in Kruger and things moved, moved really smoothly. And the thing with birding bidet is always knowing if you go to a spot and you're looking for a bird and you don't see it, do you like wait, um, wait, or do you just move on? Um, it's kind of a very tricky balance. Um, and then we went pretty much through Kruger at, um, at around 11 in the morning. Um, we were in an area which was going to be really good for eagles, um, but it, it started raining again. And so we didn't get, um, um, you know, things like tawny eagle. I don't think on our list at all. I don't think we got any snake eagles. It's just remarkable spending like three or four hours in Southern Kruger and just not getting those birds. This sort of overcast and misty, but at the same time, this sort of extra, um, uh, that cool weather just allowed like a lot of the small warblers and cisticlers and everything were just calling. So we just managed to, we were just literally just catching up with almost all things. You know, white crested helmet trike exactly in the same little areas they were before and it went really, really well. We then went to quite a cool area that not many people know about and it's near uh, Kamatiput. So uh, you can see on the map, there's Kamatiput sort of on the, um, yeah, on the Mozambique border there. And the Labombo Mountains, you can see in Mozambique, just sort of going down south. They actually go all the way to KZN. And um, exactly, this is where Mike's got the arrow there. And what happens there is there's a little bit, there's a sort of dense thicket habitat that occurs on the, just on the western slopes of the Labombos and a whole lot of the Natal birds sort of creep up there. And they just pop into that area in, in a sort of the area where it says Albert's Neck, um, just sort of around there. And so there's a farm that we went to there, which has sort of some dry bush in it that has things like pink-throated twin spots. Um, oh, really? That's bizarre. Rudd's Apelis um, and Trumpeter Hornbills and really nice selection of things. So that was a real bonus to get those birds. 
And then another thing which you also really need if you're planning a building big day route is you actually, it's critical to have farm dams um, because you know around agriculture, there's often permanent dams that attract certain species of water bird. And you can see in that area there, there's lots of sugarcane plantations, which are really kind of devastating for the environment, but which add a little bit of extra diversity to a building big day route with dams um, and all sorts of things. Um, and then we, we then decided to, we ended up um, going and ending up in the Barberton Mountains. So if you sort of look, you can see Barberton in sort of bottom left-hand side there, yeah. So we had to drive then, we had a huge drive all the way through the sugarcane plantations and the roads and, and the N4 through all the trucks. Our competing team actually had a very similar route to us, but they took a helicopter from <laughs> that area and literally flew over us to go to the Barberton Mountains and then flew back. Um, so we were, you know, sort of very frustrated by that. Um, um, but a lot of things went really is, well. Is this, of... is this similar to the Rossi video where he complained about the referee mistakes? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, you, if we consider the outcome to be the same, <laughs> but I guess ultimately it was. Um, um, but yeah, so we went to the Barberton area. If you don't know the Barberton area, it's a really wonderful area sort of on the, on the border with Eswatini with these beautiful, very ancient geological hills which are filled partly with forests, but also partly with this amazing grasslands. Um, and we, at the end of the day, we'd been there doing reconnaissance there. We just had a whole lot of birds that really came, um, you know, just a whole lot of birds that really came really quickly, which was really good. And then we also found a, a new sort of bird for that area, short-tailed pipit, just after sunset, which was quite exciting. Um, but then we also had some tremendous wind at the very final spot that we went to. So the, the, the cool thing about birding big day now is that in the past, you used to have to sort of tick things off on a paper list and submit it to bird life with the South African Ornithological Society and you get to know the total like in two weeks, but now it's live. And so you put in everything to bird lasser and the totals are live. And, um, and what happened is there's actually no mobile signal in the Barberton area. So we, there were quite a number of teams sort of neck on neck um, and so we went in, birded the Barberton area and, and didn't know that um, at that stage that we were winning um, nationally. And then when we came out, realized that we were all, we were winning, but then, you know, another team was kind of going ahead of us. And so we then had to drive around. Um, we um, w went to kind of a really special area just on the south of Kruger, sort of a private reserve called Njijan. We had a really, um, Dave Snow was a really great contact there. And yeah, we did lots of driving around at night and eventually got a painted snipe just before midnight on the second night to, to run off our 335. So no, it was, it was very exciting. So it's a great story. I, I think maybe one day I, I need to do another birding big day with you and, and take it up a notch, but uh, that's, that's a great story. Um, maybe just to, to come a little bit more local, um, talk to us about you know, where you live, you, you obviously now living in a, I've been to your house and um, we visited there a couple of months ago and you live in a wonderful area in Scarborough and there's been quite a lot of, um, there's been quite a lot of action there during lockdown. I think there's been some great birds. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's been really surprising. Um, I mean, it's, um, it's really convenient living on the Cape Peninsula, um, you know, being close to the city um, and being able to run tours from here. Um, but then but Scarborough is a little bit isolated and I guess I never really imagined there were that many birds around Scarborough. I mean, I knew there would be a few, but um, I didn't really imagine how many there would be. But of course, being locked down um, and really sitting in the same house um, all the time and then having nothing, you know, just having to explore the area just around this. this it's really fantastic because it's bordered in the south by Cape Point or the Cape of Good Hope section of Tebb Mountain National Park. It's bordered in the back by Blus Buscliffe Nature Reserve and it's got the beach in front. Um, and it's got some, yeah, some, some good sea washing opportunities as well. So it's um, just being based there has taught me quite a bit about the birds in this area. Um, for example, clapper lark is actually reasonably common in the Fainbos around the back of Scarborough. There were four calling up there the other night, for example. Um, and it's really nice to sort of be living almost in Cape Town and have clapper larks sort of right near your doorstep. It's something I normally consider to be some yeah. things that are sort of further away from Cape Town. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's been pretty cool. Um, mm. 
And then the lockdown birding itself has been good. Yeah. Sorry, Mike. Well, maybe just, um, I mean, that's that's just a photo that, that we, we chatted about. And obviously there are the yeah. risks uh, living yeah. in that area with, with the fires. Yeah, I guess I put it there to sort of counter the sort of pretty picture before, which um, is, looks like a sort of idyllic scene. But Scarborough is also really nice because it's really closely associated with the sort of, it has a very wild feeling about it. So for example, it's surrounded by fainbos vegetation that naturally burns. Um, and so every now and again in Scarborough, you have these massive wildfires, wildfires. Um, well, that could be a Freudian slipper because they do <laughs> allow wildflowers to flower after they've burnt. Um, and they also allow things like the clapper larks um, to occur. So, you know, when the vegetation gets too thick, you know, the larks no longer occur. And then when the fire sort of opens it up a bit and they, they occur in the more open vegetation, it's probably the same for Hottentot, but, um, so Fainbos buttonkernel, sorry. Um, and um, a bird we haven't yet found around Scarborough, but we think it's probably occurs here. Um, so yeah, the fire creates that extra dynamic where the vegetation around the town never quite stays the same because it gets old and then it burns flat. And so there's the, the local birds are sort of always in flux a little bit. Um, and the same is true yeah, at sea as well with the sea currents and changing seasons. Now, I remember, so the, the one bird I want to talk about is the, the message you, you sent earlier this year. I remember you, you sent a, a couple of us, we were on a group together and you, you spoke about a warbler that you'd found, um, a Philoscopus warbler, warbler um, which, I mean, we, we have Philoscopus warblers, but it certainly wasn't a willow warbler um, that you were excited about. So tell us the story about, um, about the green warbler. Yeah, I still can't quite believe it. This is, this is a bizarre story. I was sitting in the desk here where I am right now, um, doing some admin on a, I think it was a Sunday morning and heard this really strange call um, out the window. And, and I was at this stage very keen on keeping a lockdown bird list. So anything that called, it was a little bit unusual, I would go and check out and you know try and add it to the list. The list was about over 130 at this stage, I think. And, um, and yeah, I heard the strange call, knew it wasn't something like I didn't recognize it all. And uh, I mean, bird calls are one of my sort of favorite things to try and explore. So um, I sort of quickly realized it was something unusual, but I couldn't quite place it. I mean, I was still half thinking about the work that I was doing. And so I picked up my binoculars, went outside, I was calling the trees, quite difficult to see. Um, and then that popped into view just briefly. Um, and I could see at that moment that it was a philoscopus warbler that I'd never seen before. And um, I knew from various bits of reading that it, it would have been an, an Asian philoscopus warbler. It wasn't a philoscopus from Africa and that it would have been a first record for Africa because you know these birds simply don't occur in Africa at all. Um, and so I knew it was something extremely exciting. And I also knew that even though I couldn't identify it at that moment because these philosopher's balls are really hard, the key to identifying them is their song because I'd seen various articles of people describing the song differences and showing sonograms. Um, and so the moment, I saw, the moment I saw that that's what it was, I ran inside, grabbed my microphone and recorder, ran outside and just managed to record the last bit of its song before it stopped singing. Um, and then watched it a little bit more and it disappeared off. Um, and then began the whole process of just trying to assimilate that and tell everybody about it and get people to come down and come and look for it. Um, and, you know, lots of people, you know, came and looked and it turned out to be an extremely challenging bird to see. Um, and then of course, then it became, well, it was definitely one of these philosopher's warblers. Um, they're quite complicated. There's about five species that look really similar and sound quite similar, like which one was it? So, um, I enlisted the help of um, South African warbler expert and good friend of mine, Francie Peacock, who immediately drew sonograms of it and started doing comparisons and um, really was kind of key um, in helping to clinch the ID, um, which we worked out was a, a green warbler. And if you go back a slide, um, you can see that it's a bird that actually normally breeds up in this sort of mountainous area of um, sort of Central Asia a little bit. Um, I don't know how best to describe that, sort of Northern Turkey, Georgia, that sort of area there. And then the birds migrate essentially to India. Um, and there's lots of similar species, some of them very helpfully named like 
this is the green warbler, of course, then there's the greenish warbler. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of birds that all sort of, and there's a sort of been this interesting pattern of speciation um, around. And so to, to get to know, it's, it's very, it's quite subtle plumage characters um, and also vocal characters. And the, the reason that we know so much about this is because if you look to the top left, do you see that there are records from the UK, from the Netherlands, from Scandinavia? So the bird does quite often make a mistake. Um, and so even though it's a bird that you would hardly, you wouldn't expect um, here in South Africa at all, you can see that it's prone to vagrancy. So a lot of these Asian philosophers warblers are prone to vagrancy. So things like Hume's warbler and yellow browed warbler occurring almost annually in the UK. And so it was a question of once we knew it was in this group, like working out with the sonogram and what we saw on the bird, um, like to, to narrow it down to the species. Um, I won't go into the detail here, um, but because we've still got to publish this, um, but it's a perfect match um, for one of the calls of green warbler. And um, really conveniently, it's, um, it's, it also, green warbler is actually the only one of that group which has a nice strong yellow wash on the face and the throat, which is what this bird had. So that's really nice to sort of clinch it in two ways. Um, I think it's, yeah. um, you, you mentioned Fancy and I always um, remember the fact that um, a common white throat, which is also a, a warbler species, uh, flew into his window in, in uh, Langebaan. And I always laugh at the fact that um, if um, a common white throat was going to fly into anyone's window, uh, it's a good thing that it flies into the window of Fancy Peacock, Fancy Peacock's house. And it, it also makes me think, you know, um, if a greenish warbler is going to pitch up, it's quite useful that it pitches up outside the house of someone who has a huge interest in birdsong and is able to notice these things. But you can also look on the other side of it and say, well, these things are, are pitching up outside the window of many, many different people. And it's just a matter of time before someone actually recognizes that it's something special. So we can be fortunate that it uh, pitched up outside your house, but I think there were very a uh, small handful of people that actually managed to get onto it. It, it was very uh, I tricky, five, I believe. Five people saw it in the end. Um, yeah. More people heard it, um, but lots of people came and stood outside along the road in Scarborough. Most of the other residents of the road think we're all crazy. We basically worked that area extensively for about a week. Um, it was really, really secretive, yeah, bird. I know um, our good mate Dom Rollinson was one of those five that, that managed to get a view and and then a couple of months later, he, he picked up the lesser white throat in, um, in Southern Kruger. So um, definitely on a warbler run for, for Dom. Um, okay, yeah. Kel, maybe just to, um, to, to talk about this uh, wonderful bird that you photographed um, in your backyard. Oh, this is another one of the sort of almost trio of birds that occurred in Scarborough. The other ones were the, um, the white um, throated bee eaters, which weren't quite in Scarborough. But this one was... Um, was found by a, a friend of mine who's more interested in fish um, and saw the bird around Sudvata um, when he was doing marine things. Um, and at this stage, I was still very much obsessed with my lockdown list. And so I heard that there was a, a tropic bird um, at Sudvata, which is just down the road from Scarborough. In fact, you can even see it. You can even see Sudvata from my house. So I thought, Phew, could I get a red-tailed tropic bird in my garden. So I sort of had a little bit of look in the telescope and I couldn't quite see it. And then I decided it was unconfirmed, rushed down there, try and find it. So I went down there, um, eventually managed to find the tropic bird. A whole lot of other birders all came together and it was a really fun moment where we found the tropic bird. It came right past us, gave us the most incredible views. And here it is, you can see the mountains of the Southern Cape Peninsula in the background. And then I sort of, we had an amazing experience and then it started flying towards Scarborough. So I sort of thought, oh no, Now's the chance. Just need to kind of jump in the car, race back to the house, <laughs> and quickly get it for the garden list. Get for my lockdown list. So, because you can actually see, in fact, that my and, house is one of those. And houses people have the cheek to tell us birders that we're odd, eh? <laughs> so I'm not a twitcher, but so um, I thought it would be quite fun to get. So anyway, we we jumped in the car, raced back in there, and the bird disappeared. No idea. It probably flew ahead of us down the coast but we don't know what happened to it. It could have turned and gone the other way. And the bird, I think, was then seen in Roy Ellis a couple of days later. But no, it did bring the ethical dilemma into play. Like, um, if a bird can see, if I can see my house while watching a bird, does that mean that I could have seen it no, from the deck? The, the, answer's, the answer's a flat no. 
I mean, it, um, we were doing a lockdown challenge as well. And we had a funny um, incident where, where Cliff Doss was um, part of our challenge. And he was at his offices in um, near Stenberg. And um, a, a group of uh, white stalks flew over. And he jumped into his car and rushed home so that he could tick the white stalks for his garden challenge, which he managed to do. So it, it's not, you're not the only one who, who attempted something so obscure, but... Uh, <laughs> But um, speaking of uh, seabirds, um, you know, maybe um, you, you, you know, I, I love a good pelagic, um, like the next uh, seasickness prone person, but I, I've managed to, to suffer through a few pelagic trips. Um, but I, I think your pelagic experiences are mostly land-based. Yeah, I know. I think um, I've had ups and downs with my pelagics. Um, um, this year or in the last year, I had a very good one and a very bad one. So don't always do too well on the sea. So, but I really enjoy sea watching. I think probably inspired by um, Mike Fraser, um, Mike and Liz, who've moved back to Scotland, were great mentors of mine when I was a young birder. Um, and Mike certainly taught, you know, taught me how to sea watch. He did a lot of sea watching in Glen Cairn in, in, on False Bay um, and wrote lots for Promerops. Um, Cape Bird Club newsletter um, and was very inspirational for sea watching and I did it a lot at the time and then moving back moving to Scarborough I, I realized that it ha had quite a nice opportunity to sea watch and I've been doing it um, more and more um, and really during the lockdown I've been doing lots and lots of sea watching. Um, I've realized it's a little bit different people often say um, oh well, why do you bother to see watch the birds are so far out or you can just go on a boat and you can see them closely and one of my latest analogy is to say it's a little bit like um, raptor watching. Like, you know, you can go to the Kruger Park and you can see a bunch of um, vultures on a kill and you can watch them squabbling and you can look at their eyes and, and you can really have a fantastic experience. But then other times when you go, you might be standing on a ridge watching raptors soaring. And when you're looking at those vultures, you can see different things about them, the way they saw, the way they move, their patterns and their feathers. And that's quite a different experience. It's almost not the same experience, even though it's the same birds. Um, and sea watching is a little bit like that. So a lot of what makes seabirds special is simply the way they move in the air uh, and the way they use the small air currents rising up off the swell and the waves. Um, and they aren't such small air currents sometimes, sometimes they're extremely dramatic. And I, I must find, I say, it's just incredible. Scarborough is not the very best sea watching spot because it's a little, it's not, you know, as doesn't jut out as a peninsula as much as Cape Point or Komaki. But when the wind, when the conditions are just right, you know, birds, albatrosses, up to three albatrosses, I think I've had in a single day, um, can be seen off Scarborough. And if you've got a telescope, it's just really incredible just watching them twist and turn and getting to know the, diff the subtle differences between the different species and seeing pale shear waters really far out and getting to know quarries versus greats at a very far distance and slowly getting to sort of build that knowledge has been just on the way they fly has been really incredible. Um, I think probably the most exciting has been seeing a subantarctic little shearwater, which is a real rarity um, last July um, during lockdown, which is a really nice seabird to get. But um, I must say mostly what I see are sooty shearwaters and white chin petrels and thousands and thousands and thousands, sometimes 3000 sooty shearwaters in an hour. It's really impressive to think of these birds flying all the way from New Zealand and flying past Scarborough and doing a massive loop past North America. And, you know, basically, um, these small little birds which can then despite doing that can then dive you know up to 70 meters down to catch fish they're just remarkable birds i get a lot of um pleasure and interest out of um even just watching them for 10 minutes to have a little break from work so we yeah. we're gonna we um we we probably could talk for for um three or four hours but i think i want to talk a little bit more about some of some of the more um um far-flung birds and, and obviously Cape Town Pelagics is, is uh, a part of Birding Africa and I, I just wanted to touch on, on Birding Africa briefly um, because that's obviously you know what you do um, and then talk about some of the really exciting birds because that always interests me it's birds that I, I dream of seeing so maybe just talk to us a little bit about uh, Birding Africa and then we can move on to some of the most exciting birds that you, you, you can show us in, in a, a slide or two. Um. Yeah, so I guess that, yeah, that's my day job is um, running the bird to accompany Birding Africa. And um, we're a team of about 20 people. It's quite difficult now with COVID and, and the problems with travel. Um, but, you know, we're still operational and still managing to run some tours. Um, 
and yeah, I mean, there's a there's a few Cape Bertla people who you know who we work with and have worked with over the years. Um, I know Margie is well known to all of you, Margie Hemp and Priscilla Beaton, of course. Um, and yeah, there's a, a number of other guides, and we we lead tours not only you know short trips around Cape Town, day trips. We do tours all over Africa, so Cameroon, Ethiopia, Madagascar. Um, started initially doing small trips, um, Claire Spotters and myself doing small trips around Cape Town and then just going South Africa and then further and further afield. And so it's grown from there. Um, and yeah, we, um, I guess we have a reputation for being able to find some sort of kind of rare and unusual birds. Um, and so I did a talk last week, I think at the Virtual African Bird Fair for Bird Life South Africa on a whole or sort of Africa's most sought after birds. And the problem with Africa's most sought after birds is they're kind of really some really cool famous ones, um, but you can never talk about all of them in one talk. And so you have to talk about some of the more mainstream ones. So things on this slide, like the, the Picathites or rock file on the top left-hand corner, this kind of bizarre birds that live in sort of cave overhangs in West Africa and make swallow mud nests that are really quite, quite difficult to see. I mean, things like Shubal, which everybody recognizes that you get in the swamps of Central Africa from Zambia up to Uganda. Things like African pitta, which I think many South African birders view as like, you know, really special bird to see and can be really hard because of the way at times it's breeding with the rains and the rains can be different. The rain timing, the rains can change and the pittas can be quiet or they can be displaying. Many people have been hugely frustrated. Um, it's very cool things like Pell's fishing owl and that's often the best view people get of a Pell's fishing owl. Um, often, you know, very elusive until you finally see it. Um, golden nightjar, the invisible bird uh, in that bottom picture that we discovered the call of in one of our Birding Africa tours. And then uh, birds that not too many people know about, like African green broadbill. Don't bird. call it a grass broadbill, please. No, no, that's another, the bird names the another, another thing <laughs> you probably still clear from, but no, very much African green broadbill, sort of um, the Ugandan species that you get in the Albertine Rift between the Congo and Uganda, that part of that Western arm of the Rift Valley. So I talk about these in another talk. So I thought I'd choose some more um, kind of niche um, birds for this talk to talk about. And I thought the first one that I might mention is a bird that I've really wanted to see for a long time. And um, I was trying to count the other day, but I've probably done something like 200 birding tours around 20 or 25 different African countries. And um, Sometimes it's to the same places, other times it's new places. I like to do lots of expedition. And there's still amazingly quite a few birds that I expect that I would have seen, but just by chance, just haven't seen. And a bird that has intrigued me for many years is a bird called the white crested um, tiger heron or the white crested tiger bittern. And it's, um, I think it's a mainly nocturnal bird that you get in sort of, sort of swampy waterways of West and Central Africa. And just before COVID struck, we did a, a sort of a recce expedition tour to Liberia and Sierra Leone, where this was one of our target birds. Um, the roads getting around were just absolutely horrendous, as you can see, but we eventually did get onto the rivers where um, we were actually hoping our primary target on the rivers is a bird called Rufus Fishing Owl, um, which I talked a little bit about in my last talk, but is essentially a Western relative of Pell's Fishing Owl. It's a little bit smaller, and it's uh, only in, in West, West Africa in a very limited number of places. And it's in you know, often slightly more coastal um, river systems. And we spent quite a bit of time looking for um, Rufus Fishing Isle on this expedition that we did here. We can see we actually go out um, just before sunrise, sorry, just before sunset. And we, we go up and down the river with spotlights for a few hours. And in the morning, we go out again. So we go out again when it's dark and then we have the sun rise over the river. And um, we there's there we are spotlighting at night in the sort of palm forest and looking to see if we can find these rufous fishing isles and white crested tiger bittens. Um, we actually weren't having a tremendous amount of um, success. Um, eventually after a few um, expeditions, we found the fishing isle, which is really amazing to see. Um, we had one perched in a, in a tree over the river over some rapids where it must've been fishing. Um, and then the, the one morning we went up really early um, and we were hoping to hear some of the song and we heard this very distant sort of booming sound, a little bit fluff tail like 
that in the distance we thought was probably a rufous fishing isle calling. Um, it's quite difficult to tell because the river at this stage is a few hundred meters wide. So it's a very wide river um, and with forest on either side. Um, and so we, we went you know, along, this, uh, along the river trying to, it's just still dark at this stage, um, trying to sort of follow up the call. It's really difficult because the call was sort of coming along the, surf, the still surface of the water. And it wasn't quite possible to hear exactly what it sounded like and exactly where it was coming from. But we, we took our boats and we went um, across the river to the forest on the other side. And then as, it, as we were closer, we heard that it, it wasn't a Rufus fishing owl, but that it was a call that sounded a bit much more like a fluff tail, but much louder and more booming. Um, and eventually we determined that it was a white crested tiger heron. And this is the first view um, that I had of it. You can see um, still a little bit dark, but you can actually see um, how it's gone up into the tree and it's silhouetted. And you can see it's this very giant bittern like heron with a white crest. You can, can you see how it's risen, it has raised its crest there. And we can also um, have a little look at the next pick. Um, that's a little bit closer. If you don't know the white crest is there, you might not see it. But if you look really carefully, you can see that there's a white crest in there. And it's just sort of got this barred appearance, just like a bittern. Um, and I'm going to go to the next pick. So Tertius Khos, um, who's also a Birding Africa tour leader and, um, and a fantastic photographer took this. This is a photo, we were side by side. And this is a photo that he took. You can see that um, it was worth carrying his giant lens there. I mean, you can see the intricate detail of it. This stage has dropped its crest, so you can't see the white anymore, but you can see the amazing detail on the bird. So that was just such a remarkable experience to see that bird. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. I mean, it just, uh, they, uh, I mean, I've seen a, a tiger heron in, in Peru and they, they're wonderful birds, but this one must be very special to see, hard to, hard to find. Yeah, I know, it's, it's definitely. Um, Right, I'm going to move on to I'm going to move on to your next um, next interesting bird and and destination. Yeah, the, the next bird I thought I'd just chat a little bit about um, is um, going to look for um, niam niam parrot um, in Chad. Um, Can you maybe I mean I, I know how it's spelled because you've told me the story before, but maybe just spell niam niam. Um, niam niam is n i a m hyphen n i a m. Um, it's yeah, it's it's one of Africa's very little known parrots. It's found only in Central Africa and um, hasn't been seen for decades. Um, and there's quite a lot of interest in parrots. Some of it quite bad because people collect parrots, and so um, we actually not going to say exactly where this was, and we haven't um, we can't really share the exact locations of this because we worry that people might go and poach these parrots. Um, but, but a few years ago, um, we, myself and some, um, some colleagues and friends from Birding Africa went on a big expedition through Chad. Um, and I guess that Chad is quite a cool country. It's, um, it's very much in Central Africa, but it borders the Sahara. So if you look, sorry, if we can get back to that last pic, Mike, um, you can, um, you can see that's one of that's, so we, what we did was we flew, um, we tried a small airplane and flew to, to the sort of central northern part of the country and then worked our way all the way south um, through the country to try and get a nice transect of the habitat because we were looking for other birds such as newby and busted as well. And you can see there, um, this is a picture of our camp. Um, you can see the tents in the bottom there and this is sort of on the southern edge of the Sahara. Um, and you can see them sort of mountains that then become the, um, the entity um, which is a wonderful area to kind of explore more fully. And I think it would be nice to do a talk just on that. Um, but if you go on to the next slide, we sort of explored these sort of sandstone areas. We, um, there were wonderful birds there. I mean, even though it's extremely harsh, um, we managed to find what appeared to be the sort of first Barbary falcons breeding in that area in a rocky gorge. Um, a remarkable area. Um, which we'll have to talk about another time, but a wonderful gorge with sort of striped tahina spur and all sorts of things. We went down through the sort of arid grasslands of the central area um, where we saw these from Dharma gazelle, which are really down to, I think possibly even a few hundred left in the wild. I mean, it's a species that's unfortunately on the brink of extinction. Um, these 
these arid West African and Central African savannas are under tremendous pressure from hunters. Um, and then we eventually went down right to the um, south, the southern part of the country, where there were historical records of this parrot. Um, I've sort of so, put this so when you here. when you sorry to interrupt you, but when you say the historical yeah. records, I mean you. So you're going there with um, with the intention in mind of of looking for a bird that hasn't been seen for many decades, and you're hoping to rediscover it. Do you know anything about its call? I mean, you, you have an idea of its habitat, um, but, but there's very little information I'd imagine given the, the location. I mean, hardly anyone's birded there. And, and for so long, it, 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 sounds, it sounds to me almost um, uh, an impossible task. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess um, we, this is something that we try to do. A lot of our expeditions are like this. So we try to find a bird that we, that's very little known about, that we really like to see and to find out more about, to see what its conservation status is. And then we try and piece together sort of um, when it was last seen, what the historical records were, where specimens were collected in the past, um, and, and all those types of those types of clues. And then we sort of try and overlay like what type of habitat it was in. Um, and then look, now you can do things like you can look on Google Earth and you can see which type where the habitat is. And then you can sort of make educated guesses as to what type of area it might be in. And then, you know, what it's call might sound like. Uh, and then you just go and explore. And sometimes we get lucky and find these things and other times we don't. So um, there were a number of birds on the Chad trip that we looked for, a few of them we didn't find. Um, but eventually this one we did. Um, it was really exciting in, in these sort of woodlands. Um, it, it was really interesting that the transect through Chad itself was just beautiful going from the Sahara and then you go through these different, so initially it's become sort of like an, a bit Kalahari-esque with the sort of, sort of um, Sahelian acacia savanna and then it goes into sort of a drier woodland which looks a little bit like the northern it looks a bit like brachystegia woodland miombo woodland but it's a sort of northern equivalent and then you go into slightly moister woodland um which is where we were looking for these parrots um and yeah this is the team i put up at the pick in here because i know claire is well known to many people in the cape bird club claire spottiswood um and um also mentioned Julian Francis, who, you know, who's a great supporter of our trips and often joins us on these expeditions. Uh, and Michael, unfortunately not in this picture, but he was also very much involved. Um, and yeah, we, we explored the area. We, we sort of camped in a few different places that we thought would be good. Um, and then eventually, um, yeah, heard this call that we thought must be the parrot uh, one morning, and then eventually managed to track it down initially quite far away and then eventually managed to get reasonably close um, and yeah, eventually found this bird, which is really quite amazing. Um, unfortunately, it looks like the bird is in quite serious conservation trouble and the area where it is is being converted um, and it may not survive there very much longer actually. So it's a very tricky situation for this parrot. There's probably bigger numbers of them further south in Central African Republic that aren't really well explored. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's a it's a great story, and uh, I mean, when you look at um, some of those habitat shots, you you just get this impression that that it's so remote that the birds will be protected because they're so isolated. But I, I guess there's a there's a fight for for uh, land and for agriculture, and and that's where these um, species suffer. I think in these these areas. Yeah, it's quite low population density over much of Chad, but um, yeah, there is still pressure on these on on these areas where the parrots occur. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's move to. Um, I think you're going to talk to us about Somaliland, and that's one of the more flattering pictures I've seen of you, Cal. <laughs> yeah. So for Somaliland, we did quite a lot of exploring Somaliland. Somaliland is um, in the northwestern part of the country, officially known as Somalia. Somaliland has declared itself independent of Somalia and actually fought an independence war and so operates as a completely separate country um, and um, and so it's not the same as going to Mogadishu um, in you know in, there, there is much less in fact there's well there have been a few little incidents but there's essentially no conflict in Somaliland um, it's still um, a place you have to be really careful visiting and you have to have good connections um, and uh, when you go there you actually have to travel with um, sort of armed bodyguards permanently 
But having said that, it's still a reasonably safe place to go. And Somaliland, most people think of Somali, they think of, um, of this arid desert environment. Well, I can sh assure you that there are some beautiful arid desert plains with some really special birds, such as this lesser hoopoe lark, it's only found in Somaliland. Um, but it can also rain in the desert there, just like it can rain in Namibia. Um, and then all the roads, the few roads that they are, just become absolute muddy and just logistics can be extremely challenging. But if you move on to the next slide, um, this is just another pick um, that's taken at dusk of one of Africa's more special bustards, just to keep with the, the theme of Somaliland as an arid, an arid desert area. This is Hoagland's bustard. Um, somewhat reminiscent of our Ludwig's busted. But what I really wanted to get to um, was, um, you know, one of the last birds I wanted to talk about this evening, which was a bird that's always sort of um, captivated my attention. Um, it's uh, sometimes you start at the beginning of the bird book, you know, with ostrich and albatrosses, <laughs> and, and other times you think, well, I'm still in the herons, I'm actually going to go to the end. And you start at the end and you start with the buntings. And right at the end of the bird book, of an African bird book, is a funny little bird called the Wasangli linnet um, with a very strange name. And it's, it's a very strange little bird. It's black and white and orange, chestnut, and it doesn't look like anything else in Africa. And um, I've often wondered about it and, and nobody I knew had ever seen it. And, and so it was with this in mind and a few other specials that, that some friends and myself um, planned this trip to Somaliland. And so one of the very interesting things about Somalia is that, is that on the Red Sea border, it's sort of part of the sort of the great rift system. And so even though lots of Somalia and Somaliland is desert, close to where the Red Sea is, these huge sort of mountainous walls um, have been pushed up by the rifting process. And because they're so high, and so sudden, they so, as you can see in this picture, they, they sort of rise so suddenly from the coastal plain and the deserts they have their sort of own unique bird life. And it's isolated from all other areas. And so it's got sort of their own species. And because of the altitude, and it's, it's covered in a forest, and bizarrely things like junipers grow there, uh, and also remarkable dragon's blood trees. So if you try the next shot, you can that see one? the, yeah, that one. a few slides of the... You can see the cliffs in the background there um, and the sort of selection of trees. You can see some dragon blood trees there and also the trees in the front are actually myrrh trees growing out of the rocks. Uh, and then maybe the next one. And you can just in see the, it's the most remarkable habitat for Africa. So Carl, I mean, I, I know we're talking about the Wasangli linnets, but um, I mean, this habitat looks uh, like a birder's uh, sort of paradise. Are you seeing a lot of species when you're birding in that habitat or or is it quite um, is it quite difficult birding? Um, it's actually reasonably birdy, and it's a mix between the sort of arid species that are coming in from below, but also the forest species that are there, and um, things like there's a there's a something that used to be called the Somali blackbird. That's essentially it feels a little bit like an olive thrush that got isolated on that mountain that speciated, you know, olive thrush, we know olive thrush is speciated into the Karoo with Karoo thrush and then it goes up in East Africa into mountain thrush and um, there's lots of different, um, you know, each the tighter thrush and each, when, when the, these birds become highly isolated on, on distinct disjunct mountain ranges, they tend to speciate. And so there's one of these up there, it's, it's all black and that's reasonably common. Um, and yeah, um, you know, fairly good selection of birds, actually. So the reason that's so birdy is because the habitat's changed so quickly. So you come from desert into scrub into this forest habitat very, very quickly. Um, there's an endemic white eye that's only found up there, which has only been described subsequent to us visiting there. It was thought to be part of another white eye group when we were there. And um, yeah, eventually, um, so it's quite misty up there and we, we can't up there. This is a dragon's blood tree. It's actually um, probably more famously known from the island of Socotra. Um, and it's also, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually in the genus Dracaena for people who know their trees. We have some Dracaenas in Southern Africa too. Um, and it just forms this sort of very, the, the architecture of the tree is just wonderful. And it just gives this whole different vibe to, to, to the place. And you can see the mountains. And we were exploring up there. It's very misty actually a lot of the time because it's very much on this escarpment close to the seas about 20 or 30 kilometers away. Um, 
And then walking one morning, we were just slowly work, working our way through the sort of forest edge and scrub and just looking at everything that flew. And then I guess these amazing little birds popped into view. And here's a, probably the first ever photograph of a wasangli linnet, or um, I think certainly one of them. Um, and you can see it's this very strange little CDT-like bird. Linnets have got more, more the affinities with the sort of um, Western Palearctic region. You now you can see um, feeding on Lamiaceae seeds up on Somali mountains. Um, yeah, wonderful little bird. Um, and just reminiscent of this very isolated, strange place that is just, you know, just off so off the beaten track. It just sort of captures the imagination a bit. Um, we, I mean, the, the, the excitement that you have when you, when you find a bird that you're looking for that, that hardly anyone has ever seen, um, and then you get a photograph of it, it's, uh, it's quite a, it must be, it must be a rush like no other. I mean, I think it, it tops any twitching rush. I think finding a bird that uh, you, you can probably count on your, ha your hand, the number of people who've seen it. No, it was extremely exciting, actually. Um, very, very exciting finding these birds, actually. Yeah. Then we've got one more slide of, a, of another special bird in that area. I think you wanted That's to just mention one this one. The Somali golden wing grosbeak. There's another species that's isolated that occurs in the, on the Middle Eastern side, um, sort of in, in Yemen on the other side. Um, but this one is only found in Africa and it's part of this group of three species. I think the Socotra one is the other one. So there's three species that have speciated over these isolated mountain areas in this part of the world. So another very special bird that we looked really hard to find. Um, there's also a wonderful tree aloe up there that this bird often um, seems to feed on, on the seeds. Yeah. But Cole, I mean, we've we've covered some amazing birds, and I'm gonna. We've got one more slide, and and it's really an introduction to the end of your talk, or this conversation, um, and and an area that I'm absolutely desperate to go to, which is uh, which has got, I think, um, officially the highest endemism rate of, of any country in the world, which is Madagascar, and and maybe just just talk to us. I mean, you've done a lot of tours um, in Madagascar; it's one of your specialty areas, and I, and I think it's. It's become a real um, hotspot for for global birders to visit because of the the rate of endemism, the endem endemic families. Um, so maybe just uh, a few a, a few uh, quick things about Madagascar and what's special about it. Yeah, I mean Madagascar has been is um, yeah again the subject can be the topic of an entire talk. Um, yeah, we'll do that one day, I think. I bumped into this, this pic when I was um, preparing the other talk, and I thought it would be just nice to show people. It just shows. Just the remarkable similarity. I mean, Madagascar is this um, Galapagos-like place, which where um, things have evolved um, in, in a way that seems to catch our imagination more than other places, where um, you know uh, evolutionary radiations are just extremely eye-catching. And um, the, this is a yellow-bellied sunbird acety, and it's not related to the sunbirds at all. Um, I, I put it in initially in one of my other talks because it's actually related to broadbills. So acetes and broadbills are, are reasonably closely related, including the African green broadbill. And it just shows the absolutely remarkable convergence between this and sunbirds. It really looks just like a sunbird. Um, but then it's got even more outrageous eye wattles than a sunbird ever has and a remarkable iridescent back. And um, this particular species um, is a high altitude species. It's, it's only found in an incredibly small number of areas. Um, and there's basically just one ridge that everybody who ever sees this bird sees it on, it's sort of Voi Parara Ridge um, in Ranomafana National Park in Madagascar. Um, and it involves, you know, doing a walk up to this ridge, which you often get to mid morning and then waiting around and looking at these flowering plants with these little sunbird like things that kind of come flitting in. They make very high pitched sound calls, just like sunbirds as well. Um, and just the most remarkable things just flitting around in between these, in between the bushes. So yeah, I thought that might be an interesting place just to end and to give you that, that bit of extra intro into that. Yeah, Carl, I mean, I think we, um, we, we spoke about the risks of us going on for a very long time this evening and we've, we've limited ourselves, we've been very disciplined. Uh, I think we might have to invite you back next year to do another talk on, on some of your experiences. We, in fact, we, we won't call it a talk, we'll call, call it a conversation. Um, I, I think there might be some, some questions. I think what, what I'll do just to finish off this evening is uh, ask people if they want to ask you um, any questions. Um, I've got the chat box open. Um, this is your opportunity to ask um, Carl a question, but I, 
I always um, love listening to you and I, I hate it at the same time because um, I think there are so many birds that you've seen that um, I'm uh, absolutely desperate to see and, and some birds you've seen that I've never even heard of. So um, one day I'll, I'll join you in one of these far-flung places and you'll see some, some fanta fantastic birds together. Um, I'm just looking at the, the chat box. There's, there's nothing there. Um, yeah, so Linda is saying uh, we'll definitely invite you back. Um, but if there's no um, questions, um, I think I'm going to hand over to, to Priscilla just to, to maybe uh, finish off. Priscilla, is that, is that okay? Yes, that's fine. I've unmuted. Um, Callan, this has been the most wonderful talk, well, conversation, as Mike puts it. And there are just three comments in the ch chat box and every, every single, now there's a fourth one, and they all are saying, what a wonderful, adventurous life you live, how interesting your talk has been. And that's one thing that struck me really forcibly this evening. It's your sense of curiosity, your need to go and find those different birds at the ends of the bird book um, and all over Africa and your sense of adventure. And it's been a wonderful introduction and I can see that we're going to have to capture you again. And I put capture in inverted commas because I've been trying for so long to get you to come and talk to the bird club and you're always too busy. So perhaps COVID has been kind to the Cape Bird Club in that perhaps you're slightly less busy at this time. And that's why we have managed to get you to come and chat. We need um, to have you back to tell us in more detail about your Chad trip You've just tantalized us. That's all. <laughs> so we definitely do need much, much more. And just by the way, I did see that Claire is in the audience tonight. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's great to hear. Um, yes. I, I'm glad you didn't say anything nasty about Claire, um, Carl. Um, yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think uh, Priscilla, maybe just to, to correct one of your points, Kel is extremely busy, even during um, during lockdown. Um, and and I, I, I mean, I, I to get hold of him. <laughs> I did. Um, I did have to apologize. Well, I'll apologize to you now, Kel, for for chasing you a little bit. But uh, we 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 ran tight with the presentation, all well, the slides, and and uh, it was well worth uh, pushing you to to get them done. And uh, yeah, I know it's a huge sacrifice for you, even to spare a few hours to put it together. And I think that's why we chose to do it more in, informally. But even when you do things informally, they, they come out so formally. And I'm very grateful that we've we've had an opportunity to have a chat. I've been fortunate to to host you at my house for a, a roast chicken or two, where we chat about birds for, for a whole evening. Um, but uh, it's wonderful to hear you share them with the uh, Cape Bird Club. So thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, and thanks, Priscilla, for finally getting me here. I mean, I might be busy, but I'm trapped at home, so I can't say I'm going away at least. Um, but <laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, just reflecting a little bit, um, you know, I, I gave a reasonably brief introduction to like my experiences with the Cape Bird Club, but it was obviously very formative in terms of my birding um, <laughs> journey, as the word people use these days. And, um, and I think, uh, it's, you know, I'd like to thank the Cape Bird Club, you know, generally and all the people who've helped me and sort of encourage everyone to continue. I know it is a very welcoming club and always encouraging young birders um, to keep doing so and to not underestimate the impact that you can have on people's lives through relatively small interactions. So thank you. Thank you. And then I also want to say thank you to Mike for being such a wonderful interviewer. <laughs> right. <laughs> thanks, thanks um, Priscilla. It's very easy interviewing Cal.